All right, let's do this. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to another exciting coffee chalk with uh, Asaf and I. Uh, we're going to be talking today about the creation of your software bill of materials with the f -Bomb. Um, so welcome everybody. This is a quick talk. We're going to be doing this the rest of the week. Uh, we might extend this going forward in the future, but, uh, let's do a quick introduction of ourselves. Um, uh, since we were short on time, I'm Bill Manning. Um, I'm one of the solution architects here at JFrog and I am joined with the wonderful and amazing Asaf Cohen today. So Asaf, say hi. Hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Asaf Cohen and I lead the security solution at JFrog. Uh, joined from the video acquisition and specialize in software security. So, uh, Excellent. Bill, do you want to go to the next slide? The next slide, and we can I jump will. into playing sure. what is software with material. So, essentially, software with material is essentially the uh, the ingredients that uh, that pretty much comprise all the software that that you have. Uh, let me just jump back to the slide. Yeah. So essentially, whenever you have to build and you create your, your product, so uh, the first part of the code or the code that your developers create are essentially not the whole picture or not the, not the full uh, uh, software that is going to be delivered eventually. Eventually, during the compilation process and the build process, uh, your first party code software links and, and, and integrates with other uh, dependencies that are being added during the build process that eventually the end binary that you're going to have uh, is comprised from your party, from your first party code, as well as all those uh, dependencies that you rely on. Not only those dependencies, but also the transitive dependencies that, that uh, are being used by the dependencies that you use. So essentially, if you would look at your uh, end binary, you would see this graph of like more and more dependencies that compile into, into your, uh, your end deliverable end application. So the software bill of material is essentially having the ability to list all the, all the open source software components that your software used with their uh, version and license information. So that way you can know exactly what comprise your uh, uh, bio. And uh, and this for, yeah. Go ahead. I was, I was just about to say that if you move forward to the next slide, so Bill can explain more about what, what he's been used for. And uh, you can take it from here, Bill. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the thing is, is the software bill of materials comes from, um, you know, it's actually been around for, the idea has been around for a while. The actual concept of it being a standard, especially in the United States, uh, starting around 2018 with the Food and Drug Administration uh, wanting to know what software was going into medical devices, right? They're the same company, um, you know, the same entity uh, that went ahead and said, every piece of food you eat, you need to know the ingredients. Well, why not that? For, you know, the same thing for software. Because remember, in this case, software could kill. I mean, if you have a, a bad, you know, pump of some sort for the heart, or you know, maybe an insulin pump or whatever, and the software is bad, it could literally kill somebody. So the FDA decided to put the place to say, hey, any sort of software that you have, we need to know about it. And this actually translated over to the U.S. government also back in May, stating that they want to have a, a better software supply chain. And, and the way to actually make sure that the security and also the information is done correctly is through an SBOM. So if you want to work with the U.S. government now, you need to use a software bill of materials. They want to know what's inside. Because it's not only just the transitive dependencies, both direct and indirect, but it's also too the way it was composed. You know, what software was you know what was used for? Were there any environmental and system information? It's all the pieces that make it up. But this is when you you know this is a way for companies to have a system of record and provide that system of record of the software that's built. So this way they know what's inside. So it's just like anything else. It's like having a manifest for all the software that you use, and this can be used for things like tracking information on potential vulnerabilities and issues. Also. Also, too, we'll talk about some of the ways of looking at the way the components might not be approved. Also, for license diligence, uh, this is actually a huge thing with a lot of companies and making sure that liability risk is also being addressed, not just vulnerability and security threats, but also liability. And the SBOM is supposed to be a way of accountability is what it comes down to. So when you provide this to a company, they know exactly what they're purchasing, not just here's a software agreement, sign it, install my software. Now here's a software agreement, sign it. Before I install the software, I want to review with my security team to make sure that everything that I've indicated is actually being um, is actually approved and actually utilized by our organization. 
So Soft, you want to take, kick this off? We can talk about this together too, is, you know, what are the benefits of the S-bomb? You know, it's not just an accountability thing. There's a lot more too, right, uh, Soft? For sure. So so essentially having the, the ability to, to map and have the software as material, as mentioned, this is being requested by, by the US government and more and more companies request this. And it's more than just, you know, uh, being, a bit, being able to identify the software components, their vulnerabilities and licenses. Just think about about uh, the processes that you can gain and visibility that you can gain from having this software of material. So uh, right now, if people would have asked you, okay, which type of vulnerabilities do you have? So you say, okay, I can take my software and scan this, but I got this point of time that I have to scan, and then the next day it's disappeared. By having a way to create continuously software of material and upgrade this and get this more and more information over time, it can also help you to do retrospective checks and be able to answer the simple question: If I if I got compromised, how much uh, how how much backwards from date perspective does the vulnerability take take place in my in my application? So it helps you to manage the whole uh, 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 application uh, bill of material with the landscape of vulnerabilities. Across a, across a long timeline, and the ability to accommodate this can empower you and your company with a lot of knowledge that, that can really help you to manage all the requirements from both the external parties as well as, as, well as being able to answer those simple, uh, yet simple questions about, all right, I have this CV. Am I vulnerable to this, to this uh, CV? And also, uh, if I do, which, which versions are vulnerable to this CV? So by having this, it allows traceability, uh, ability to, to see the uh, improvements and, and the exposure over time, uh, and also comply with, with the, uh, with the uh, compliance of, of licenses and post-compliance. Um, and you see emerging technologies and standards such as SPDX, Cyclone DX, and other standards that, that were built in order to have this protocol of sharing this information between companies. So uh, the, we see the, the market and the world now driving to have more and more visibility into the software that comprise your software. And, and, and saying that, Asaf, you know, that's actually the way, you know, we look at the typical developer, you know, and they're developing their code. Of course, they depend on all these third party transit dependencies that they have. And the thing is, is that, you know, when they compile their code and they put it together, and they ship it off to their customers, um, you know, what happens if there's a vulnerability in SOP, right? What happens if there's some sort of compromise somewhere along the way inside of the software supply chain? You know, you don't want to be able to, you know, you should give this to your customers. You want to make sure that you're able to inform them, you know, most of the time beforehand, or you should actually have the responsibility of addressing it way beforehand. But the thing is, is though, you know, giving the indicators to your customers that, you know, you know, that it could be a dependency that was used to build the software might actually uh, pose a risk to your customers. Now, the thing is, is that when we look at this, it's not just the direct dependencies that are a part of it. It's also the indirect dependencies, which also could cause a threat. Everyone else is, is very, you know, probably knowledgeable about the ideas of solar winds. We always talk about solar winds. Like, so it was a hot topic. It affected a lot of people. It's the billion dollar, uh, you know, remediation plan that has to be put into place. Uh, you know, but the thing is, though, is that was actually caused by an indirect uh, dependency. One of the Orion libraries that was used to build the Orion software for them, um, when they did this, somebody actually did a very sophisticated coordinated attack where they actually compromised a third party indirect dependency. And that indirect dependency was brought in as part of the build process. And when they brought it in, it actually went ahead and it affected it all the way through the chain. Now, the thing is, is that when you are looking at all these dependencies again and pulling them in, you know, where the software build of materials really excels is the fact that when you're building this, it takes all that information and puts it into the software build of materials so that you know what the software or how it was composed. So that if there is a change somewhere, you can also reflect the change. So if you update a, a, one of the components that's inside of the software as a transitive dependency, both direct and indirect, you can upgrade the software build of materials, give it to your customer, and then they can see what are the changes between those versions and how it could affect them. What if there's a vulnerability inside? Well, as the software pointed to before is, you're gonna to wanna to know, first of all, what piece of software was it in? Is, you know, when you get notified by your vendor, the vendor says, hey, this was actually in some of the software. They can look at their bill of materials and go, yeah, you know what, this directly affected us. But the thing is too,
two is, is that when you have this level of information, one of the nice features is, is that, you know, being able to go in and say, hey, that vulnerability also affected these other versions. And if we actually migrate and move up to maybe, the, you know, 1.4 in this case, um, that issue has been resolved. But this gives the customer visibility and insight into your you know, how the development is being done. Are there any compromised solutions? Um, you know, is it where it has been affected? How long have you been affected by it? And it's just a good way to have that level of information and accountability as an organization on both ends, as the vendor and also as the customer. So um, the next part we're going to talk about is just misconceptions, because I want to make sure we leave enough time, uh, you know, towards the end. We're actually doing pretty good on time here for once. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, Asaf, do you want to take this, or do you want, you want to take some of it, and I'll take some of it to all? Uh, so, so essentially, there, there is a, a saying that says, that says, like, security is the of security. By the fact that, that uh, you can have security by, by not exposing information or not giving information, by not showing something, you see, you think you're secure. So there are some misconceptions that say, well, if I'm going to project my software of material, would this uh, decrease the level of security that I have? Would it make the, the attacker life easier to exploit my software or find any 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 link to the source code or or expose any intellectual property? So the answer is, is no. And the answer the answer is no because you're right that that uh, if, if someone, if a random people, if a random person would have, you know, just one and O's, your battery, and, and it will need to explore, and so and so. So if, if that person would get the software material for some reason, so they get better visibility to which libraries you rely on. But from an attacker perspective, from a research perspective, that's that's not as that's not hard to get this information anyway. So it doesn't produce the, the risk that you have. It actually raises visibility so that your customers and the people that, that do monitor this would be able to react faster upon a threat. Uh, being able to know uh, quickly that something is happening, I need to act fast, I need to patch, I need to update, I need to do something. Uh, for the attacker point of view, uh, they don't rely on the software the material. They, they're going to do their own research and going to find, uh, going to try to find bugs in open source software component dependencies as well as the first party code that comprise this, this uh, piece of software. So uh, it, I think that the pros are much higher than the cons or the potential cons that you might think of. And the software- It's like the same idea. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> oh, no, I was gonna say, it's like the same idea as if you like, going back to the idea of list of ingredients for FDA, right? I could give you a box of, of you know, uh, you know, cake mix and tell you to go make a cake. Um, with, if I don't give you the instructions, you're not gonna be able to make the cake. You'll be able to look at all the list of ingredients and it might be, you might look at it and go, yeah, this looks fine. So it's the same kind of idea, right? It's just a list of ingredients. It's letting you know that this may contain nuts or you might have a soy allergy. <laughs> so, so uh, essentially having the list of software material does not expose anything about the source code, does not expose anything from the intellectual property. It, it even helps to be transparent and, and show that you don't violate any license, that you know what you're doing, that you're confident, and you have the possibility to act upon, uh, upon an action or a threat or something. Absolutely. Uh, so we will the next slide? Yep, here we go. Yeah. So yeah, so the software bill of materials probably start off with the first part. If you want to work with the U.S. government, and actually this is probably going to work its way into other governments also. If you want to work with them, you're going to have to have a software bill of materials for it, right? You are going to have to produce something. Um, you know, now there's a quick understanding of you know what it entails, like what are the pieces of it. And we actually, Asaf and I have done other talks on this where we go into great detail. So you can always look at the JFrog uh, YouTube channel. I think there's. There's a couple up there where we go into detail on how to actually do this. Uh, we'll be actually going ahead in the future and supporting the SBDX format for Bill of Materials, which has now become uh, the standard for the U.S. Um, on top of that, you know, the whole idea here is, is that there is the audibility and traceability. If you, by the way, if you're a customer of ours, uh, you've used JFrog for a number of times, we've actually had the basis of this. Our actual artifact build info, when you create a build and you publish it into Artifactory, is the good base to start off with a, billing, a, a full bill of materials. 
You can actually pull that build information from our API if you wanted to, or download it. You'd have to go through and parse it, which we'll go parsing it in the future. But actually our bill of materials has a lot of this information and it will allow you to address any of the security and compliance needs you have. And then also provide, able to provide that to your customers also. Uh, we have about a minute left. Um, so uh, Asaf, is there anything you want to add in at the end? Uh, because I think we're at the end here. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for, for your time. And, and tomorrow we will continue with, with, uh, with more uh, subjects. We're going to have this uh, uh, many subjects during this, during this week. Uh, so stay tuned. And if you have any questions, you can pop them up on the, on the Q&A se section. Um, and we look forward to see you tomorrow. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Asaf, as always, total pleasure to see you. And I'm glad to be doing this talk with you. Uh, cheers, everyone. Be safe and be well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Phil.